wants to be accountable to, to making sure that we're doing good, leading to good policies, good programs for people. And I think those people are also, perhaps more importantly, the future people, not even just the current people. Like, making sure that we're setting up good policies and learning so that next year, in five years, in 10 years, um, where there's actually far more people than just right now, we're actually doing what we can to improve uh, the outcomes for people for years to come. But unfortunately, we can't actually be directly accountable to them. I mean, that's just, it kind of goes with your second question, right? It's one thing to say we're accountable to them in our spirit and what drives us and why we're motivated. And everybody can be that way, but the reality is we're actually going to be accountable to a contract if we're an organization. There's someone who funded us, and there's going to be some terms in that contract that say you have to do A, B, and C. And the reality is that's what you're legally accountable for. And you're accountable to the next donor who is going to want to see something. Now, if that donor wants to see a big emotional appeal, well, then that's what can be delivered and raise money. Mm -hmm. But that's a shame for our true aspiration, which is helping people. Because we don't want to fund over who tells the best story. We want to fund over who has actual good evidence when, there's, when evidence can be had. And so there's, there remains that disconnect, but it really is in the hands of the donors to make, that, to make that work. And organizations can be driven by the desire for evidence. But ultimately, if money flows to rhetoric over evidence, then rhetoric will get funded over, over evidence. Um, Darren, you want to get into it? It would be a real shame if we, if we allow ourselves to frame the question of accountability as oppositional. You're either accountable to the community or you're accountable to donors. Organizations that are effective and authentic are excellent at both. And so I don't see them as oppositional. I see the challenge is that when donors using power privilege their narrow specific interests to distort the behavior of organizations which in turn make them actually less effective and less accountable. And I think that's what we, that's what we, um, that ought to be if we were to get the Venn diagram on, on what the problem is. Uh, I'd like to isolate it in that way rather than making anyone feel it as if, you know, you can't be authentic and grassroots uh, and, and of the community and still have a contract and, you know, be accountable to Geneva. I think you can do both. And I think that there are a lot of, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that actually part of our work should be about doing both. It should be about being that bridge and about pushing funders and donors to open their minds because very often if you're sitting in Geneva you really don't know what's going on in Kigali but if you are working with people who do you can help the people in Geneva see that yeah these parts of your vision your mission we absolutely align with but this part of your methodology could be strengthened in this way. And actually, we both get to where we want to be if we work together slightly differently. And sometimes they push and they make us as organizations working on the ground more effective because they open our minds. So I, I think I agree with you. It can't be oppositional. It absolutely has to be about how we just do this better. No, 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 this is exactly, yeah. we're totally on the same page. And, and my point is that not all donors see it that way or behave that way. Yes, I don't think is, any donor would actually point, that, look at you and say, not I disagree, all donors. But, but their behavior sometimes is not driven by evidence, but is driven by simply intuition and hope and, and platitudes. But um, the other thing about evidence, Francis, I'm sorry. You go sorry. right ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. This no, is what's supposed the, to happen. The, the other thing about evidence, and this goes back to the discussions that um, were launched when um, Melinda Gates talked about the, the new funding around data, that evidence is not neutral. And so somehow we need to make sure that absolutely we want to know what's happening in women's lives. We want to know what's happening in communities, but we want to make sure that the questions being asked are questions that actually will drive social justice. And that means we have to also break the hierarchy that we have about privileging northern academic knowledge above 
community wisdom, as it were. I'm, and I'm, again, not an either or, but we have to break it, because at the moment, we're undermining our own work. Really great when we have evidence. If you look at what some of the groups, um, some of the networks like PMNCH have done by actually having evidence and collating evidence about when the most dangerous times are for women who are pregnant, the most dangerous times are for um, newborn infants, and what kind of interventions can be made, it has been staggering. I mean, it has made this enormous difference. But if we collect evidence that is either irrelevant or, or truly only reflects one, one vision of the world, we end up not doing the mm -hmm. work that we need to be doing. Well, I think, I think you raise, in a sense, the next point I wanted to get to, and that is this question. When you say, when you speak of social justice as a goal, that we should have social justice involved, one of the questions really is um, when we're talking about ev evidence or effectiveness or just developing how we're going to give and why we're going to give, it's a question of values. So what, if, if evidence is not neutral, the values you bring to looking at evidence or to seeking evidence are going to be very, very important. So are there some differences in, in values among the people here on this panel? There's nothing wrong with having different values. I mean, you know, uh, I just want to be sure that that's clear. It's not like this one has bad values and this one has good values. I and mean, there are such things as inadequate values. Um, perhaps, you know, but, um, but at any rate, so we're not, we're not trying to judge the values that people have. But it's important to know what value set somebody is working from in terms of how they decide to give or how they gather evidence. What kind of evidence are they looking for? I mean, Darren, I think that one of the things that um, I think all of us have noticed is that um, from my perspective, perhaps from, not from others, um, the Ford Foundation has adopted a values approach to its grant making. It may have always had a values approach, but at this point, you, have st you and the board and the organization have put forward the question of inequality as the central factor that you want to deal with. It then has many offshoots, but you're going to evaluate the issues you deal with and the groups you support based on the contribution they make to the reduction of inequality in the world. I got it right. Okay. And so that's, that's the value you came to. Well, part of it is, is, is just defining what are the drivers of inequality. And there again, you understand the difference of perspectives and values. As we ask most economists, experts, what were the drivers? What we heard were expert answers. The drivers were technology, uh, globalization, trade, labor. I mean, there were a number of things that, um, that uh, I think are quite compelling. But it was very interesting when we asked our colleagues in our offices around the world, when we asked our grantee partners, those drivers were often mentioned, but there were other drivers that you rarely hear about. For example, persistent prejudice as being a driver, um, gender uh, marginalization and the, and the fact that, uh, that we have patriarchal systems that marginalize women, that that's a driver, that we have cultural narratives that justify why some people are advantaged and others are disadvantaged. So we have these drivers that are really, we believe, very much about values. And very much, if we're to be able to reduce, reverse this scourge, we have to deal with that. Uh, yes, we need to deal and, and recognize that we've got to have more input in education, um, technology. I mean, all of these things we've got to invest in. But if we aren't prepared on the issue of women and girls to address 
the systemic, cultural ways in which they are marginalized, we will continue to see huge, huge gaps in equality between women and men. So I'm simply saying that, that for us, as we look at what we invest in, therefore, absolutely we're going to invest in economic research to understand, but we're also going to invest in uh, the storytelling so that we see uh, the narratives that reflect uh, empowered women and girls, uh, that we see the visual imagery uh, of, of women and girls uh, who are in control of their communities, their lives. Um, so, so I think that will be manifest because at the end of the day, we won't solve this challenge. Yeah, I'm gonna to go to you in a second, but I wanna just do a quick follow-up with, with Darren on this. So Darren, when um, inequality is reduced as far as it can humanly be reduced, we have a state of equality, um, are people not gonna be poor anymore? Are people not going to be hungry anymore? Sure. So let's be really clear here. Uh, and, and I have been asked this question. I have never said that we have to end inequality, economic inequality. In most, uh, most well-functioning, the, the idea of a well-functioning economy is one that has incentives. That actually, if you work hard, there will be higher payoffs for you if you work harder. If you have more input, you will harvest the benefits of more outputs. I mean, that's, uh, that is, I think, fair. That's a very different world than the one we have today. Right. And even in that environment, you've got to have social protection so that people who aren't winners in that economy can live with dignity, um, can live with some floor uh, of capacity to feed their families and uh, lead a de decent life. Okay. Charlie, you wanted to get in here, and then I'm going to go to Dean, okay? Well, I feel like I may be being overly simplistic here, so uh, forgive me, or concrete. Try it. All right. Well, I kind of am simplistic <laughs> and concrete. So in terms of the values that I feel we at The Life You Can Save, and, and many people I'm sure in this room are supporting, I, I think we value reducing suffering. And suffering would be as defined by the girls and women who are the victims of suffering. And I've heard it throughout this conference that lack of access to contraception, lack of access to uh, abortions when needed, lack of access to all kinds of health care leads to a lot of suffering and leads to a lot of premature death. And so at the risk of being concrete, I think that we need to address suffering as the victims of, of the, the people who are suffering define it and to do the most good to reduce suffering. It doesn't mean that we don't support advocacy that may deal with reducing suffering over the longer term or where you'll get to changing social norms or um, attacking patriarchy um, or many of the things that need to happen to make the world uh, the way Darren just described it or in my mind even better than that world that Darren just described, but we're not gonna get into that conversation necessarily. But right now, I think the challenge is to reduce suffering, premature death. It's not inflicted by a bunch of uh, North American academics or um, it's as it's defined by the people that I've heard in this room and as it's defined by the people in the community and I think it's critical that we prioritize the reduction of suffering and premature death and that that's the value and that the group I deal with is to try to talk to people very different than the people in this room. People who don't wake up in the morning thinking about extreme poverty. They don't wake up in the morning thinking about the effect of lack of access to health care and how it affects girls and women, how the lack of education affects girls and women. They think more about um, 
getting their kids to school. They think more about how they can consume more. They think about a host of other things, but they don't think about the issues that we're talking about here. And I'm talking about many of the people that are contributing the $250 billion a year um, just from the United States alone that could be much better used in my value system to reduce the suffering that this conference is all about. Okay. Dean? So, um, so I just want to, I want to be a bit concrete for a moment about the conversation that we had a little bit ago about evidence and, and kind of mm -hmm. storytelling. Storytelling is, you know, the way that we often will use and, and when we're doing advocacy work, when we take evidence and we want to bring it to light, bring it to the world to see, often that is done through storytelling. And because it's an effective tool of helping people understand what something is. What is something doing? What is it, how is it changing lives? Um, but I think it helps to just, I want to get out of the kind of platitudes for a moment and just say exactly, um, give you a very clear example of where hope and intuition and rhetoric can go wrong and where evidence can help. So let's take microcredit. Microcredit for a long time was advocated as a um, tool for increasing income for the world's poorest. Um, it missed on when we, we saw lots of studies that were done that would do things like find a few of the borrowers from a program, talk to them about how they perceived microcredit to have changed their lives, find the ones that are good stories because it was being told by advocates who wanted to sell it, and, and then, you know, was using this to raise money. And a lot of money poured into microcredit, philanthropic money, ran, flowed into to microcredit on that pretense. Um, when we talk about whether something is working or not, what, we, what we're saying is, or we should be saying, or asking, is the question, how have lives changed in a, how have lives changed as compared to how they would have changed had this thing not happened? I mean, that's a not any, people don't always, can't self-reflect on that. What would I be doing right now if I didn't go and get a PhD? I don't know, I can give you a few ideas, but I have no, I mean, how do I really know that? Um, it's a very difficult thing to say, imagine if a time machine, go back in life, and do it again without something and tell me what would have happened. That's not an easy question to answer. So the way we typically do this is to employ, employ the scientific method and to set up a test. Um, same way that we would, same thing we would expect of prescription drugs as we take every day or you know, many days of our lives, cold medicine, anything like this, has all gone through the same kind of, same kind of approach. And when we set up randomized trials of microcredit, um, in seven out of seven studies, we found no average impact on income, and also we found that the programs were not reaching the world's poorest as a separate side point. Um, they were providing some important benefits, so I'm actually a fan of microcredit, but it's not achieving its goal that would set out to do from a philanthropic perspective. Now, what, what happened when we saw these papers re released was that a lot of people said, wait a second, but it wasn't about increasing average income, so they moved the goalposts, and they said, no, it's about women's power. But it turns out in zero out of seven of these studies, even though they had wonderful stories to tell, many, many borrowers of microcredit telling wonderful stories, women, about how their lives have been empowered by getting access to credit. In zero out of seven studies, though, did we see with direct measures of household decision-making power within the household an impact on women's power. But yet that's where the rhetoric moved. And it's a very powerful rhetorical story. I've heard many of story that is very heartwarming very compelling, very emotionally triggered, but it turns out to not map to where the evidence is. So what did we see that was working? Was savings, giving women access to their own savings account has led to better power within the household. And, and actually a project that we did with support from the Ford Foundation um, starting about seven years ago was the Ultra Poor Graduation Program as it's called, which is a multifaceted program including a lot of integrated um, an in, in integration of many different things, a grant of a productive asset, um, access to a savings account, consumption support. Importantly, nothing about that program was directly targeting women's power. There wasn't a curriculum that was part of it that was trying to promote that. Um, but what you know, we had was this, this idea that was out there of this program that lacked evidence. Um, and we went out with, uh, it was actually Ford that started this and came to us and said, we want to take this big idea that lacks evidence and, and really just pound it, pound away at it until we can get some dominating evidence. And that's what, that's what ended up happening. We now have seven randomized trials on this, um, all pulled together, show dramatic results and improvements for women's power in the household. Again, there's nothing targeting that. So it's, it's an exciting result that 
that was not designed to do that in the sense that it wasn't the prime goal, but it was a byproduct. And yet microcredit, which does have that rhetoric, doesn't do it. And we wouldn't have been there with food stories. We no, got there with but evidence. But Dean, the thing that I, I absolutely agree with you about mm -hmm. the microcredit story, and, and I like when evidence can really help understand what is happening. But the truth of the matter was, or is, that women's rights organizations were saying really early on in Africa that microcredit doesn't work, not in that way. Mm -hmm. But nobody listened. So I'm not saying that the evidence isn't important. I'm saying that who we decide we're listening to is an issue. Because if people had listened to those activists mm -hmm. early on, and in some of the areas around HIV AIDS support groups, those microcredit schemes actually endangered women's lives because they, you know, long story, I won't go into it, but, but <laughs> people, uh, women, women's rights activists, women in the community said really early on. So it's not that evidence isn't an issue, and I love those stories where you can actually point to programs and then look at the evidence that's been gathered and then look at the benefits that have come out of that. It's just the fact that very often the people who are driving that agenda about what is evidence and what evidence do we collect and whose voices are we listening to have an agenda that's very different to those people on the ground. So what I would say is, how do we make that work better? How can we make sure that the people who decide that they're collecting the data are asking the questions that the women and girls that we are involved with and who these issues most affect are helping shape that. So how do we get women and girls at community level to shape the agenda for the evidence, to shape the agenda for the evidence collection, to be part of that collection, because who asks the question and the way they ask the question also affects the answer. So I just want to see us do that better. So, I'm not against evidence, so, I'm just so, pro. So two, two comments here. One is, you know, at some level it requires, I think, a lot more specificity because what I see being done on the ground is exactly what you're describing and when we set up randomized trials. That's exactly that kind of, we couldn't collect data without that. So I don't think there's any disagreement whatsoever. Now, the specificity might be about how that's being done and maybe there are ways to do it better and we're always trying to learn how to do these things better. So we're always open for these things. So, but the way you just described that is the way I would describe the data collection. So I think if, there's, if we're, we're either perfectly aligned or there's areas to learn, and we can't, it's hard to do that in a plenary kind of platform. Yeah, exactly. No, we can but talk the about other, it afterwards. But the other point which I think is, more, is, is, is important to me to distinguish is, you know, I hear you that you know, there are groups that were saying microcredit does not do that, but there were a lot of groups that were, and they were very powerful and had strong rhetoric to them, and there were women's groups saying, let's do microcredit. So the fact is you had two groups out there, strong rhetoric, both making the opposite argument on this exact point. Why wasn't one listened to? Because maybe they lacked evidence. Well, because no, there was another group out there that was powerful, emotional, exactly, but and they driving clearly that didn't home too. have evidence. Because if they did, then they would have well, had a different result. Either. But the other but side I didn't actually, either. I think it's about who it was because they may have been women's groups. But actually, my experience was that a lot of the people that were driving mm -hmm. the rhetoric about microcredit were funders and they were large international organizations, many of whom had an, their own agenda in doing that. Mm -hmm. So then... So, yeah, uh, we'd have to go back in history and count exactly, heads and see exactly. who they were, but I've no, been, but I've been in panels with people from, yeah. from countries making the case microcredit mm. solves women's powers. Or not but solves, you know, but addresses no, women's addresses. powers. Issues. But the other thing about that is it actually also goes back to Darren's point about mm -hmm. um, donor agendas and somehow, sometimes how they distort mm -hmm. what groups on the ground want to do because people think they're saying this, I better go for that money. And, and, the, and it's not malicious a lot of the time. I've seen groups who are saying things like, well, we're involved in home-based care. We can't keep going because we don't have the money to keep going. So we'll go for that little pot of donor money. We'll do something slightly different, but then we'll have a little bit of money at the side to do what we really want to be doing. And before you know it, your whole organization is distorted, corrupted, and you're not even doing what your mission or your vision originally was. So we, we have to look at that both the, the power of money 
and um, of chasing money, and sometimes our own undermining of our own values and our own aims. Mm -hmm. it's not I would just say on this point yeah. that, <clears throat> again, this is not oppositional. When I talk about storytelling, I'm assuming that there is good evidence around which you're telling stories. I think, unfortunately, what happens is we have researchers, storytellers, we have uh, community, and we've, we've got to build the bridges because the challenge is, and I think part of the reason, um, I mean, Dean has isolated a, a very, very good example, but I think part of your response, Theo, is that this is a challenge uh, of power and in the example that you've given, obviously powerful interests had taken on the micro enterprise uh, objective, right. uh, agenda, and we're moving that uh, globally, um, washing over the voices. Um, that's not atypical. And I think part of what you're, what you're saying is, um, this is a trend that plays out all the time in lots of different spaces, not just microfinance, uh, but in lots of different spaces where uh, we, Northern Institution, decide an agenda or an intervention, and um, you know, one of the multilaterals decides to take it on, and it becomes part of a large global initiative. And I think the systems get geared to really execute, execute, execute. And uh, often uh, the, the voices and the knowledge of those privileged institutions and the people who occupy positions in those institutions are advantaged over the voices of people uh, in country and community. And I think that's, that's a key issue that we have yet to really deal with. Right. So let me move us forward. I do want to get to um, the whole question of within the ph philanthropic community at this point, what do all of the new trends mean for people who are, for those of us who are working on issues related to women and girls, issues related to sexual and reproductive health and rights? But I, I want to follow up first on, on Darren, what you were saying, and ask um, all of you. Um, is the, philanthropic, is the philanthropic community today doing a better job at building bridges than in the past? Are we actually, with some new ideas, seeing the same, same, same old, same old, couple new ideas, couple new words, but same old, same old relationships? Or are things getting worse or anything in, in between? And it's a difficult question because we have many sectors of the community. I mean, right here, we have three sectors of the community represented. We have, um, we have the sector that deals with individuals, convincing, advising, helping individuals to make a, de a decision, which is the direction in which the life you can save has moved. We have a foundation, you know, a long-standing, established foundation in the larger community. We have the women's funding community represented. And I think that while you, you're not quite the, an advisory group to many sectors of the philanthropic community in Innovations for Poverty Action. So, and then we have missing, we don't have sitting here, we have the corporate philanthropic community, which is not on this panel for, you know, didn't happen, but that's okay too. So can't get everybody up here. So are these people really doing any better? Are some of the newer ideas that are coming up? I mean, certainly one of them, which I think we'll talk about in relation to women particularly, is, is this notion both in foundations, we have foundations like Hewlett, um, which has taken a, a, a leading role, in a sense, within our foundation community on effectiveness. They want, a, you know, we have government funders like DFID, who have also made effectiveness a very big word in how we fund for the future. Um, you know, and, then, and then we, you know, so we have all of this, this going on 
at the same time. We have foundations and governments who are talking more about um, uh, funding from the bottom, you know, who say, well, we really want to know what the people think, we want to know what the women think, we want to be guided by our partners overseas. So you've got a lot of that stuff going on. But are these bridges being consciously built? Do people, are, are more people, more funders getting it? What do you think? Theo, what, what do you think, Theo? I'm going to go to Theo first. Because she's, she's the one who's the most directly affected by this stuff. And it's of us up here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Possibly. Okay. So how do you see it when you deal with the philanthropic, with people who have money? Okay, I think the first thing is that it's not homogenous. You know, that mm -hmm. the, the, the philanthropic community is like every other community. It's, it's, it's fragmented, it's got, you know, pioneers, it's got people that you really don't want to spend more than two minutes of your day with. It's got this whole range of people within it. And so that affects um, what you see. I do, the thing that I like is that I think that people are talking more about giving and the nature of giving. I think that what I don't like so much is that people quite often forget to talk about power relationships within giving and that that can actually make giving um, as ineffective as not spending the money properly when you have it. We, we come from a, we are a women's fund. There are women's funds across the world, many of whom were set up um, specifically to look at raising funds from women in women's communities and giving and supporting the work of women's rights organizations internationally. I think that because of that, we have a slightly different agenda to some other types of philanthropic organization. Um, you pointed out at the beginning, it, we, we feel as if we're closer to our constituents sometimes than especially large philanthropic organizations that may be based in different ge geographies to the people that they are actually wanting to work with. But that's just one, one type and one example. I suppose that part of the issue for me is that this whole thing about giving or funding isn't just about philanthropy, that philanthropy is one area within the whole donor network. So if I could very quickly point to two different aspects of it, I think when we're looking at bilateral and multilateral funding, I get really worried these days because all of us are talking about women and girls. I mean, it really is. You go to the Clinton Global Initiative and the whole of the private sector is talking about women and girls and investing in women and girls. But I actually think that what we mean by that varies hugely. And when we are not clear about what we're talking about and what we're talking about, it becomes very dangerous. So we sit within the women's rights community and we still see a decreasing amount of money going to women's rights organizations on the ground. How do we expect to truly change the world when those organizations don't get the money? It doesn't make sense. And this is not a recent trend. The Association of Women in Development have done a series of studies on where's the money for women's rights. And th that, those studies show that the money's getting less. So when people are then saying that they're investing in women and girls, and they might be investing in one small area, because what we're seeing is, yes, people are talking about investing, but it's not necessarily women's rights. And if you end up, for example, only investing in making African women be entrepreneurs, then what happens to all of the other rights that those women really need to have achieved? What happens to all of those other issues that aren't dealt with? And it's not that every organization has to cover every part of it, but if the trend is towards a really limited definition of working with women and girls, then I think we're in trouble. And one of the things that I really worry about is still this tendency to have African women and girls looked at as a series of problems. We are not a series of problems. And until we are seen as the solutions, 
And part of being the solutions is that we have the money to spend and that we control that expenditure and that we influence the way in which those investments are made, are defined, and are accounted for, then we're not going to change anything. So I think the philanthropic world really needs to take a good look at not just what it says it's doing, but how the money is spent, how it's accounted for, and the questions that we ask ourselves at the end of that. Thanks. So Charlie, I want to get you in on this because um, you, because you, you represent, I know this is the, I, the I, women's I, funds I, over I'm, there. I'm, this, I'm sitting this way and I'm like consistently saying, okay, there's a cheering section over there. <laughs> I get it. Um, and that's great. Charlie, you represent a newer sector with, within, the, within the money community. Um, and that's a sector that A, goes after individual, tries to help individuals. Um, and you're hearing a lot now here and in other places about some of the challenges around all of this. So how well do you think the new sector, of which you are a part, is doing in terms of some of the issues that people have raised here around, um, you know, and they are around who makes decisions, uh, how do you figure out what's effective, um, what kind of effectiveness are you looking for, all of these things in terms of uh, how much of a partner are you really, how much of a partner is this new sector with the people who are women, poor, that's whatever, we, you know, marginalized, Etc. In terms of, of you, you know, it, it, it seems often, you know, and many may not be familiar with this, that there's a kind of quantitative, mathematical algorithm that drives that sector. That while it has a deep belief and desire to alleviate poverty and alleviate suffering, is thinks that you can figure out how to do that through math. So I don't... I'm I kind of laid it, you know, on the yeah, line here. Right, no, that's good. Um, I don't have a historical perspective. I'm understanding what Theo's saying, but I don't have a historical perspective. In, so I can look at this from a longitudinal perspective. The sector that Francis says I represent are uh, a small group of people, let's be candid, and you know, compared to the amount of money that the Ford Foundation and other large foundations give. It's an emerging group of people that are trying to look at using money effectively, and I think Francis is right. It's dominated by people who tend to be quite analytic. Unfortunately, it's dominated um, in many ways by white males who tend to be very analytic. On the positive side, I think, and I think we need to he get feedback on this from women and girls and, and women's organizations in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia. We are supporting, in the Life You Can Save, 17 charities, including Population Services International, which is very well represented here. And I guess I operate as the executive director of that organization where I'm doing philanthropy education with people who are extremely naive about what's even going on on the ground in health uh, for women and girls, um, as well as, as men and boys. Um, I think we're, what we we're making the assumption, correctly or incorrectly, that the charities that, we've, that have been evaluated by organizations like Dean's, that are very important to us to be able to talk to donors about effectiveness, it's a very uh, clear that what they're doing, a fistula surgery, appears to be something that is very valuable for a woman who could be otherwise ostracized from her community. Malaria bed nets seem to be an effective intervention for helping not only girls and women, but helping whole communities uh, from getting uh, malaria. From keeping, a number of these charities are trying to keep children alive until they're five years old, when we all know that mortality uh, becomes much less, uh, premature death becomes much, much less likely. So we have a very limited focus, unfortunately, because advocacy, things like women's rights um, and supporting organizations like that are much harder to measure. So I think this movement is, is very quantitative, but I do assume, and I'm interested in feedback, and I think we need to get that feedback, that the charities that we're supporting and the ideas that we're supporting of people's ethical obligations to use their privilege, not to help people as problems, but to 
help people who are suffering from illnesses that have long been eradicated in the de so-called developed countries. So I assume that the charities themselves are doing this work because girls and women, women's organizations, and the communities themselves want that work done and see it as valuable. If that assumption is wrong, then we're supporting the wrong right. charities. But we make that assumption, we're very new, and what I'm hoping to do in our organization is to grow the numbers of concerned people that actually do change social norms. That it is no longer reasonable for someone to not care about the suffering that's going on. The 700 million people that are suffering in extreme poverty. It's no longer okay to say the charity begins at home and that that aphorism is the dominant aphorism. Right. We're trying to say the charity begins with each individual being equal, regardless of whether they're born in South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, or South Seattle. And those are the ideas we're trying to get across. But if we're supporting charities that are insensitive to the needs of people on the ground where those charities are trying to help, then we are making a big mistake, and we need that feedback uh, to, to educate people I properly. can see that there are a couple of people who want to get in, and I, I just want to make a few comments as chair. I, said, um, I think that we're all very interested, everybody in this room is very interested in efforts to expand the giving community. We all need more money. The SDGs need more money. And so we love the fact that new people come along and want to do this. We're worried about, I'm trying to read the audience, we're worried about what you're going to recommend. Okay, you're going well, to... The recommendations are transparent, and I think people should be worried, but I think my assumption is that they should be more worried if we don't expand the circle, and that we have to be sensitive right. to what people want. And, and then, I, okay, and then the second thing I just want to flag, I um, flag it all the time in this, is that the word charities drives me crazy. Okay? This, for me, I'm sorry as the chair to say this, I'm sure Theo could do it too, but um, this for me just smacks of the late 19th century, early 20th century notion of the privileged giving to the victims, the poor, the suffering. You recommend organizations. I think that's, that's a good correction. And, and as long as we are trying to expand the number of givers, if we keep putting this on the, I am the giver, you are the recipient, I go back to my original question, is what is the quality of the exchange between the person who gives and the person who receives, who also gives, and the donor who also should be receiving. So the, the, you, you don't quite have a full, how do we have a philanthropic world in which there is as much as possible, because power cannot be eliminated, as much as possible a reciprocal relationship that is genuine, not based on noblesse I do, oblige. I do want to make a comment. I do think Sure, you should, should because... I you know. think the charity, so the word charity is awful, and I agree with you, and I use it because that's how these organizations often refer to themselves, but I think we should not use it. But I also think, I, I just want to make a comment that there, at least for myself and the people that I work with, um, it should be contextualized what it means to be giving to people in sub-Saharan Africa or South, South Asia. Well, let me be particularly clear, because if you look at what has been extracted by American corporations from those areas and not given back, all we're doing is exchanging money that essentially has been stolen through <laughs> stealing resources. So I, I, I don't really view it myself as giving anything to people and being noblesse oblige. I'm not Cecil Rhodes. Of course. I mean, so I think that we do need to understand that we are talking about um, basically an imperial power, if we're talking about North America, excluding Mexico, um, if we're talking about Canada and the United States, we're talking about an imperial power educating its own people about a sense of obligation 
to begin to equalize. It, it, it will no way equalize. I mean, if we talk about interventions in Nigeria, for example, we're not going to equalize the amount of money that's been extracted to, to the amount of money that's given. So I do want to make that comment. Yeah, yeah. and I, I'm not you know, trying to be mean here. No, I think you <laughs> should on, be and mean. And I'm on Charlie's I mean, board, so you yeah. Know. <laughs> well, you can be mean because we know each other. But okay. I, don't, I don't feel, I think that if we don't have these kinds of feedbacks, like where I have a blind spot or I use the word charity, or where we're supporting an organization that we take to be doing good because it's distributing malaria nets, but somebody in the community is able to point out a problem with that, then I think we need to be able to get that feedback loop and we need to be vertically more integrated, meaning the people who are doing bed nets need to be more integrated and then there needs to be more horizontal integration okay. between people who are doing this kind of work and hopefully right. those feedback I wanna, I Can wanna I give you us? just one quick example of yeah. the one, one of those things? I don't know who your organizations are, but I really hope that you're um, funding some groups that, really, that are based in the global south and yeah. not just those in the north. But when... Um, you were talking about women's rights and that that doesn't happen. Without women's rights, almost anything that you do is not going to be as effective. So if you look at the issue of bed nets, and this comes back to the evidence thing, that at one point, um, people were just saying, let's get the bed nets out of there. And there was one report, one research report that was done, and I can't remember who did it, it may have been UNICEF, which actually, first of all, looked at the number of bed nets that had been given out and everybody thought, fantastic, great success. But the number of children still getting malaria was huge. And when they went into the communities, what they found was, yeah, the bed nets were given out, but the fathers slept under the bed nets and the women and girls slept outside. So I, I, and so I, that's I, your, I, I, yeah. yeah, I, want, I actually want to, I want to okay. kind of cut this because okay. we could Women's now, have, talk more we could now have a 20 minute discussion about whether the bed net thing is effective or not. And no, no, it's not bed nets. Yeah, Women's no, rights within I it. understand, but but you know, so we want to kind of avoid that, and we've got a certain amount of. I've got this little clock in front of me, so I know what's going on. So if there are any, in terms of time, if nothing else, um, so I really want to get. I don't know about anything else, but I do know the time. So um, you know, so I want to finish whatever it is that's in this part, and I want to move us as rapidly as possible to the question of what's happening with women. What's happening with funding for women and girls in the, and for sexual and reproductive health and rights in this current climate of where donor interest is moving? So uh, you've been very patient, so I want to give you a shot okay. at um, closing out this, seg this segment. Uh, so we move to the next one. So I'll actually, I'm, I think I can segue the two. So Great. With the, with the point, I'll just use your second question as an example for the first. So, you know, the first question simply stated, I will just repeat a little while ago, is just kind of what's changed in the philanthropic sector? So the, you know, I, I see two things kind of roughly that I would say has changed, but I think at the heart of it, you know, not that maybe this doesn't matter, but I think is the causal like kind of thing under the ground has been just radically cheaper data um, and communication both. So, I, you know, kind of think of it the same way, you know, the acquisition of data is cheaper. And that's because of things like, you know, the internet, to simply put, cell phones, things like this. Um, but, but also the, the price of data has gone radically down. And that has allowed us to see a lot more evidence that's out there, I'll collect evidence more cheaply. And what we've seen in the philanthropic sector, and look, I'm kind of young in this space. I've been doing this for maybe 20 years, roughly. <laughs> so still feels young, but still, regardless, when I first started, from this side of the table. Um, I think one of the... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Francis. One of the, the bigger... I only meant me. <laughs> uh, the bigger changes has been the, um, in some sense, the, the um, humility within the philanthropic sector, realizing how small it really is compared to the world. And so with that and cheaper data, what, you, what we've started to see is a lot of philanthropists, foundations, high net worth indi individuals, recognize that they're a catalyst for change. They're not going to be the change itself. They're not, they're gonna help, they can help trigger things, they can help, you know, kind of get some fire started, but they're realistically, you know, with a few exceptions out there, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation ending polio, right, great, but most, for the most part, even, even groups as large as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation realize that their biggest value added is as an innovation, as an incubator for innovation and evidence, so that governments and, and for-profit firms that have scale can learn what's working, what's not. 
Um, and you know, I think the example I referred to earlier is a good example of this. When, you know, when Ford Foundation came to us with this, this idea that it was an innovative idea that had little hints of things that were weak in evidence beforehand and said, let's, let's tackle this. Let's, let's really annihilate this question with some sort of, you know, kind of first, first stage where we can set up, um, you know, very similar studies across the world, um, try to understand if this is working or not, because the early suggestive evidence was nice and strong, but not as powerful as having it kind of pervasively um, learned. And obviously there's a lot more, I mean, at some level we learned a lot, but, you know, it's still right. the tip of the iceberg. But that kind of um, thinking, saying what's a big idea that we need evidence for that the world can learn from in the next five to ten years recognizes how small ultimately the, the philanthropist is, but figures out how to leverage that as effectively possible. That wouldn't be possible though without cheaper data. So that, that I think does lie at the heart of it. I don't know the preferences have changed. I don't think the philanthropist all of a sudden became more philanthropic, so to speak, but, but you've seen that change. So I'm going um, like, I'm, I'm so, to ask yeah. Darren, I mean Darren you've been quiet for a little while now? So I want to get you in here, and um, what do you think is happening in terms of, as you look at the, you've looked through the inequality lens and other lenses, and you also now have within, within Ford the core organization concept. Um, you, you want, I will let you say what it is rather than my saying it. And so where, where are those issues related to women and girls and also within women and girls, sexual and reproductive health? How, how are they going to fare in the future? Well, I think the real challenge, I won't, because it would take me 20 minutes to answer all of those, but I will say that I think one of the core issues, because I spend a lot of time with new philanthropy, with people who are um, on the West Coast, for example, starting foundations. Um, we learned, uh, we legacy foundations, did many things that I think we are proud of. But we also, uh, like most northern institutions, acted very arrogantly. And, and those excesses have been well documented. Mm -hmm. And many of the failures of development are in part a reflection of the arrogance of western institutions. The question that I have about the next generation, we have a, an entirely new millennial class of billionaires and centimillionaires. Um, we have people who are uh, in the giving pledge and doing high net worth family investments. Will they learn from our arrogance? Will they internalize in their behavior um, the lessons so that they don't make the mistakes that we made? Interesting. That to me is a real question. Yeah. And I think the jury is still out um, because it is disturbing when you see very successful women young women today who can say publicly without a rebuke, I'm not a feminist. I'm not a, all of that Gloria Steinem stuff is, that has nothing to do with me. Right. Um, that kind of, of mentality about success means that there is a disconnect between the intervention and the larger movement. And I think that's part of what we're talking about here, which is you can't, if you expect fundamental change, it is important to do the projects, but there will not be fundamental change without addressing rights, without addressing the core uh, issues of patriarchy. Um, and, and again, these are not oppositional. They're not oppositional. They're actually interdependent. The problem is they get positioned in public discourse and in policy discourse as oppositional. Or mm -hmm. that Peter Singer's way is the only way. And anything that is not adhering with that 
is a waste of philanthropy, or that if you don't invest in women's rights, then you're really not investing in women and girls. These are not oppositional, but they get positioned to be these kind of winner-take-all stakes, which I think are, is right. such a disservice. Yeah, I think if they were, I think I, I might slightly rephrase what you say is that they need not be oppositional, right? Although they are so often presented as oppositional, and that, um, again, I'm gonna you know, express an opinion, and that what we don't have is a lot of listening going on. We have a lot of positioning going on in the philanthropic community right now. I mean, probably we always have, but it's much more visible, perhaps, in a way than it is. But, but that positioning um, is not serving the advancement of the field well. Can I just add something but to now that? I'm because, wondering, yeah. Darren, you were talking about, for example, the new wealth coming from the uh, millennials. The, one of the other things that we're seeing, and I suppose I'm just adding to your thing of I really hope people are learning past lessons rather than reinventing broken wheels. On the African continent, we've actually seen a real growth in the number of high net worth individuals who are giving in philanthropy. And some of them are doing some really amazing, outstanding work. Our fear are those who are learning, in, in inverted commas, about philanthropy from what has been done in the West by previous high net worth individuals and mimicking that rather than growing the circle of philanthropy and the impact of philanthropy. And I think that that's something we really need to work well with. We have to work with people because this is not a field that everybody is, you know, really au fait with. But the other thing I wanted to say again, just because I have to say it before we go, in terms of philanthropy, one of the things that on the continent there is an African philanthropy network which is comprised of African philanthropic organizations, activists, um, uh, individual high net worth givers, etc. One of the things that's become so, so clear for us is the importance of recognizing a different type of philanthropy in Africa, that we've had generations of what you can call a horizontal philanthropy. It's not just about our high net worth givers, it's about the people in communities, the, the women in villages who actually give small amounts out of really limited incomes, but actually those amounts have been going towards philanthropic activity for generations. And it's actually not just Africa. If you look at somewhere like the United Kingdom, where the largest fundraising organization in the country is Comic Relief, most of their money does not come from high net worth individuals. It comes from ordinary citizens in the UK giving five or 10 pounds of their money. So we also need to break our vision of what is philanthropic giving because it's also, and this goes back, I, I'll stop going back to the evidence thing, but there is an evidence thing then about how much our ordinary communities giving in their own development, which means that people might stop looking at communities and women and girls as simple recipients of funds and actually recognize the work and the money and the input that's already coming out of those communities that we don't give real credit for. Yeah, I want to turn to Dean, but I want to actually ask a question in relation to that. So, um, Theo has been making points throughout this, this session around, around the question of, of women's rights. Um, Darren's re referenced in various ways the importance of systemic change. Um, and this, and I look at you, the two bookends here, Dean and Charlie, in a way, as in part people who are very much into the evidence-based, the evidence you know, and we increasingly hear many of us, random control trials, this is the gold standard. So how do we deal with things that really don't lend to this kind of evidence? Are those second-rate donations? 
I mean, and if you're, you, you, I'm going to, I'm getting to you. Okay. And if, you know, you are discovering better way and more effective way, discovering and putting forth better ways for people to defeat global poverty through evidence, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to, what's going to happen to the people you advise and to the people who don't fit your model? So, Are we going to starve? So, no. And, and Thank that, you. That would, be a bad, <laughs> that would be a bad world to live in. Um, so I think, and this, this goes to, um, I, this was the segue I was, forgot to make. No, you should do your point part, too, Ray. But. Which was, you know, I think of three rough worlds of the things that are in the, um, being done by uh, organizations. Um, funded by philanthropists, whether large or small through comic relief. Um, one are the things that do cleanly map to the equivalent of a social service delivery. Um, it is doing some sort of training in the communities. It is um, trying to shift social norms through some edutainment. It is maybe doing microcredit, micro savings, savings groups the old sport graduation, but it's something at the household level that's, that lends itself very cleanly and nicely to collecting rigorous evidence. Even in that space, when I look at the program, for instance, here, or at other conferences and other, with other sectors, it is striking how many things are being presented, people advocating for what their, what their program does, um, and how ultimately we have to choose. You can't fund them all. And that's all we're trying to do is say, look, these things sound good. Do we really want to fund based on who's the best speaker? Or do we want to fund based on which one's going to move the needle the most? So those are the kind of the easy ones. Go to the other end of the spectrum. Um, and, and, you know, but that is where we have a funding gap for knowledge generation. And we look at the NGO sector, and we should be thinking of them as incubators, innovators, for then government policy, for-profit policy. The other end of the spectrum are pure advocacy groups, trying to change laws at the national level, right? This is important. There's no doubt about that. Nobody, I don't think anybody disputes that. How to allocate across those two, I, I kind of want to punt. I don't want to be in a world in which we're seeing either. There are ways of thinking about whether advocacy groups are doing good or not, and whether they're advocating well. I think the simple question that I've heard, that if you can't answer this question for an advocacy group, it's a sign they're not really thinking through it, which is who is going to do what differently? A lot of advocacy groups cannot okay. answer that question. Oh. There is a middle group, though, which right. is people are advocating for law changes where the, the, stepping, the building blocks of that can actually get evidence, um, where it is about a policy change, and you, can, and you can use evidence to decide whether that is a good policy okay. change or not. All right. We, we actually, um, you don't see this, but I see this. The clock says I have 49 seconds, but, but I saved 10 minutes. Okay, so we actually have another 10 minutes. So I'm asking the booth to reset, to give us that last 10 minutes that I was going to hopefully save for you, but I didn't. And we have, so we have 10 minutes to move this forward. So I'm going to ask all of us, probably including me, to be tighter in our, in our comments so that in this last 10 minutes, we really get to address this question of sexual and reproductive health and rights, women's rights, women's funding of a variety of sorts, and where it's going, in the, in, where is it going to go over this next period of time in terms of being competitive for resources in the current climate? So who wants to get in there? Charlie, you well, wanted just, to get in, I but just, do you want to address that? Yes, I think, okay. I, I think that we're looking to become better at educating people about all these issues, about women's reproductive rights, about the needs of women and children, um, and about people's obligation, and that obligation is profound, but that's not how we, people that we work with see it. They don't see it the way people in this audience sees it. So I'm much more of a developmentalist than a utilitarian philosopher, and I believe that people need to be brought along to begin to see things at a different speed. And we have to decide how to allocate resources and what's the best way to educate people about the relationship between 
women's rights and women's health and how which one has a primacy or if there isn't a primacy. So we're involved at The Life You Can Save in the business of education. And so we don't have the answers, but we're trying to learn how best to add to the improvement in the lives of women and girls, primarily or almost exclusively in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Not as a sense of giving it to repeat, but as a sense of obligation and, and you could even view it as payback. I mean, okay, I've got to cut people off a little bit because we have a limited amount of time. So let's, let's rephrase the question slightly. How are we gonna make it better? I think we're gonna make it better uh, by working at these issues in a more intersectional way. I think we, one of the challenges for the movement and for many movements is that we've allowed ourselves, whether it's uh, African Americans, Latinos in the US or women or to be siloed, to work independent of other movements without understanding the intersectionality that is needed to advance all of our people. And I think one of the things that, is, that will be essential if we are to make more progress is that we've got to work differently. That's one. And we've got to help men understand that, that this is in their interest. This is in our interest. This is not in the interest of women. This is the interest of our communities. Thirdly, we have to affect the psyches of young girls to understand that the achievements, the advances that they are privileged to now uh, enjoy uh, absolutely are at risk and should not be taken for granted. It's one of the things that if you understand, so for me this is so, this conversation is so interesting on many levels, but if you have clarity about what you seek in the world, and so I have complete clarity, I mean to me this is, this is not about charity, it's about, it's about people being fully empowered. And if people are fully empowered, then the power, all of the things we're talking about will be, will be solved. Great. And, and so I think though for that to happen, we have to change. We who are empowered, we who benefit from a power imbalance, uh, a gender imbalance, et cetera. Okay, now this, these are turning into final remarks, which is what we have in terms of time. So we've each got, you got two minutes, two minutes, and then I get to say something, and we're finished. Okay, so <clears throat> I really agree with the comment about intersectionality. I think we make it better by working together, and we make it better by recognizing our differences and working out how we can work together to change things and that we don't all have to be the same to get to where we want to be. I think we make it better in this community by making sure that every single one of us that has a voice or has influence in terms of where money goes works to make sure that the localization agenda is really being pushed forward, that we actually start looking at dismantling that system of power which privileges ideas, voices, groups, and financing from the North and make sure that we actually have a more equitable way of dealing with it. I agree, it is not an either or, but it is about being able to have both. And at the moment, that's not what we have. We have too unequal a system. So we have to track the money and we have to make sure that that money is getting down to communities and that that money is being influenced and spent and shaped by the women and girls who are most affected by the issues that we're dealing with. Thank you. Jean. Oh, I, keep, I keep thinking it's my phone. Okay, so I, I think I can reduce my remarks to three sentences. 
life is full of really tough choices. We need to be more modest about what we know. Right. And we need, and thus we need evidence to guide our future choices. Okay, oh, that's great. It left me a lot of time, Un unfair. Um, okay, what I wanna, what I want, I wanna, I was, th during this panel, one of the things I was thinking about um, as a person who is more of a recipient than a giver for most of her life, um, is the constant demand the philanthropic community, the donors make on grantees. You people have to get your act together. Okay. We hear it all the time. You have to get into coalitions with each other. You have to figure out what's supposed to be done. I'm tired of hearing from this group that we have to go this way and this group that we have to go this way. We want you to get in a room and we want you to get it together. Well, we all know that there is more than one way, so there are some uh, shortcomings to the get it together story. You people, you people get it together. So now I'm gonna say, you people, in the philanthropic, and we say this privately all the time about the donors, you people have to get it together. Um, there are a lot of very exciting things going on in the philanthropic community now. There are many segments of that community. Um, there are lots of new philanthropists who come to people like Darren. I mean, everybody makes their circuit. What should I do, Darren? Where should I spend my money? Um, you know, what should I do, Dean? What's important? Charlie, where should we go? Not too many, not enough of them go to Theo. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I'm going to send them. And so I think the philanthropic community has a responsibility to figure out mechanisms, and maybe it's all going on and we just don't know, mechanisms in which greater communication, greater dialogue, greater opportunities for people to exchange their differences happen. And um, that will be to the benefit of all of us, I would think. So I want to thank everybody here. I hope you thank the panel. I hope, I hope, I hope the panel was helpful because we do want to be helpful. Um, and um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.